Luke's purpose in writing the book, he tells us right in the first verses, is so that he can introduce a person he describes as Theophilus to Jesus. So the whole book is effectively about introducing Jesus. It's a, it's a, it's a funny name, that Theophilus. And lots of people have wondered about who this might be. We're not, he's not identified. He looks Greek because of the name. But it's, it's a name which actually means, well, the, the uh, Theo bit means God. The Philio bit or the Philos bit means love or lover. So the name means something like lover of God. And people have often wondered whether this is a generic person who's meant to be just each one of us, each one of us who loves God. So Mark is, sorry, Luke is writing and introducing Jesus to this person called Theophilus, but then again, it might be just you as a lover of God. So I thought that was a good place to start. He introduces Jesus through a, a number of different aspects of the story. You'll, you'll notice if you read the birth story, Jesus is introduced in a particular way and he's being introduced all the time as the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel or the King of the world even. And you've got all these different aspects of the beginning of the story. Mary and Zachariah's prophecy is full of expressions of introducing Jesus. And the angels and the shepherds... Um, for unto you it did say, born in, David, in, a city, in the city of David, a saviour who is Christ the Lord. And they talked about the fact that he would bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Simeon and Anna, similarly. And then Jesus becomes a boy in the temple and we see the remarkable knowledge that he has and the remarkable relationship he has with God. And then the baptism and interestingly, in Luke's Gospel, after the baptism, we have his genealogy, which is clearly designed to show that he's a, the son of David and to be recognised as the Messiah. So all of what Luke has done up to this point in time is introducing Jesus. So we've got to expect that what happens next also is about introducing Jesus. What comes next? after the, well, the baptism story really, is the, um, is the temptations. But in the baptism, it is God who introduces Jesus. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is God's introducing of Jesus to the world. This is God's introduction of Jesus to us who are God lovers. This is God's introduction to tell us how to see Jesus in the future. And then Jesus is led into the wilderness. How? With whom? With a spirit of God. This always amuses people because they, they, they can't understand how God might be involved in the temptation. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus is driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In Matthew's Gospel, he's just led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. So whatever's going on here is not outside of God's plan for Jesus. We've got a, an intertestamental New Testament view of the devil. In the Old Testament, the devil is the opponent, but only in the sense that he's the one who, who tests or checks up on how faithful the people are. He's not the tempter as such who distracts the people from God's way. They do that all by themselves. He then accuses them. It's like, it's like a court of law. It's set up in that kind of context. The, God is the judge. The Satan or the devil in the Old Testament 
is the prosecutor. Well, in the New Testament, we finish up with a defence ret- attorney. Jesus becomes a defence attorney. So you've got this courtroom setting, which is set up, as it were, for the prosecution of the, of the, uh, the accused. It's all a very negative image. In this context, Jesus needs to go through a process of thinking through what it means to be the Son of God. The temptation is, God introduces Jesus in his baptism as the Son of God. So Jesus then has to go into the wilderness to assess what that means. What does it mean for him to be the Son of God? We often make this story look like this very negative um, fight, as it were, between this really bad person called the devil and Jesus. So we get these images of, of two creatures out there in the wilderness, one looking very nasty, bat-like in that case, uh, um, another image. They're all negative images of... Jesus out there in the wilderness with this terrible person trying to, trying to force him to go another way. When the job of that person or that thinking process in the wilderness is to question his understanding of what's going on here. And if he chooses to go the wrong way, then he does. That's his responsibility. That's his responsibility. The old excuse, the devil made me do it, doesn't really hold water. And we'll come to that a bit later as well. What we have really is a picture of a a man in the wilderness thinking through the process of what what it means to be the son of God. He's sorting out what it means to fulfill the mission that God has given to him. The chosenness of his birth, the development of his life, all of that comes together here where Jesus has to agree. Now that's an interesting question in in the human mind. Does Jesus have a choice? Does he have to agree or does he have no choice? Does he have the power? Is he just so completely... God, that he has no choice. Well, that's what the temptation is about. It's very similar to the fact that when we are baptised, and I, I used to warn people about this actually, when, when I was conducting a baptism, I would warn them that after their baptism, they're going to have a bit of buyer's remorse. They're going to have to think about what they've done. They'll, they'll realise that they've done something rather momentous. And then they'll question whether or not I wanted to really do that. And some people really do go through that experience of questioning what it means for them to have chosen this. Well, All of us have to go through the process of trying to identify what it means for us when we in the baptismal waters, at least according to what I believe, are also declared by God to be my child. God says to us in the waters of baptism, you see, Jesus, in a sense, didn't need to be baptised. Jesus was baptised as an example for us to show us the process Do it for righteousness' sake, says Jesus in the water with Matthew. So we too have to work out what it means to be a child of God. And that's a big thing. That's a big choice. And some of us choose different ways of doing that. And some of us fall foul of the test according to the typical test that Jesus has given. 
we who have to make that choice also need to understand that Jesus has been there before us. This is part of the example as well. For we do not have a high priest, and this is the way that Hebrews likes to talk about Jesus, because that's the nature of the, the Hebrews' thinking. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Hebrews is saying that Jesus has had to go through the process. It wasn't a fake process. He had to make up his mind the same as you and I have to make up our mind. Now, what Hebrews says is that Jesus made the right choices without sin. He made all the right choices, but it doesn't mean that the suffering of the temptation or the test or the struggle that that in, in means wasn't real. So what does this tell us about Jesus? It tells us that he was very human. In the 21st century or the 20th century, that almost sounds like a strange thing to say. Back in the first century, there are two heresies which were identified. And I've talked about these before, I'm almost certain. There was what we call the Docetics, who couldn't cope with the fact that humanity and divinity could coexist. So the Docetics said, Jesus is God. He must not be human He's an apparition of a human, that's what he is. And that was declared a heresy, I think quite properly. There was another group of people called the Ebionites who said that these two things can't coexist. So Jesus is absolutely human and there is no divinity about him. He's just a prophet, a good prophet, but just a prophet. That was also declared a heresy. It took till the 4th century for the church, in its wisdom, to try and work out this dilemma, which has always been there, about what is the nature? Who is Jesus? Is he human or divine? Or is he both? How do we work this out? And really, they couldn't. So they made an assertion. The assertion of the creed is that Jesus is totally human and totally divine, which means that he is totally human. He goes through all the suffering, all the struggles, all the temptations, all the grief, all the uncertainty, some degree, or the, the dilemma about uncertainty. He has levels of doubt. He deals with all of that according to Hebrews, without sin. But he deals with it. And that's really important to me. Because if Jesus is not human and cannot show me precisely how life works for a human being who is the Son of God, then he's not really my saviour. And that's a radical thing to say, I think. I think it's really important that Jesus is showing me as a human being what life means. And it's through that example and that forgiveness and that encouragement and that grace and that example that I find life. The 20th century and the 21st century has been a little bit ascetic. It has Jesus walking just slightly off the ground. He's not quite human. And I think that's something we need to make sure doesn't completely take hold because the humanity of Jesus is really important. Particularly here where we need to understand that this high priest who is ours understands us 
completely. He doesn't float above us. He's one of us. He is God with us. The sorting has to do with self-interest versus God's will. No one, when tempted, should say, this is from James, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire. One is tempted by one's own desire. The old devil made me do it, doesn't work. Look inside. When temptation comes, look towards yourself, not somewhere else. Because it's your desire that is tempting you. Luring and enticed by it, being lured and enticed by it, then when desire has conceived, it engenders sin, and sin, when fully grown, gives birth to death. So the struggle is about what it means to be a human being, what it means to do God's will. Jesus was tempted to use the power which is given to him by God for a variety of things. One, to provide for himself. Now, who could ever argue that's a bad thing, to provide for yourself? He was hungry. He needed food. When we're hungry, what do we do? We get food. We eat. And if we've been without food for a good, good period of time, then we're going to find something to eat. The temptation is to use unique power to turn this stone into bread. To, unique, to use what you might call God's power to provide for his own needs. And that's not what Jesus is on about and that's what the test is. What are you going to do? Are you going to feather your own nest? Oh, lots of Christians have done that. Are you going to look after self-interest to the degree that you lift your position in the world so much so that you look down on others? There's the temptation. That's the bread temptation. We tend to brush it aside as something to do with other things, but it's really about looking after our own interests in an unbalanced kind of way. Never wrong to look after your, your own needs. But there's a, a line that we must be careful about crossing. It's part of the dilemma. And we live within the dilemma to gain political control and position. To, 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 he's tempted to take over the world. I can give you power in the world. And Jesus was so popular, he could do that. And the temptation is throughout the story. I, I, I miss the fact that back there it said that he was tempted 40 days. Now, 40 is a very interesting number. It simply means, in the metaphor of the, the, the story, the whole journey. 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days, 40 days and nights of rain for, for, for Noah. You know, that number has um, 40 years or something. I can't remember what that was. Um, Anyway, 40, 40 means the whole journey. So temptation for Jesus didn't just happen there on that, in that wilderness once. It's like us. It happens all the way through, all the way through the journey. So he's being tempted all the time. And I won't go into other examples where I think he'd been tempted. But here, he's being tempted with political control to, to fulfil what some people thought the Messiah was supposed to do. The Messiah was supposed to become a political, military, strongman ruler. He's supposed to free Israel from its enemies and set up a new kingdom of God on earth. 
And there's the temptation. Fulfill an expectation that some people have or do what you're called to do in the will of God. He was called, he was tested, well, he was tempted or, or, or tempted to test God, God's care of him by doing a populous thing. Throw yourself off the temple. Now, throw yourself off the temple is something you would do in the middle of the city. Everybody would see it. And if you got caught by the angels, as you say you will be, then it will be a really remarkable event, won't it? Everybody will flock to you then. It's a popularity thing as well as a test for God. Well, Jesus rejected that too. Because it's not about my popularity or about show-offs or, as Jesus said, you shouldn't really, well, you must not tempt the Lord your God. So what does this say about Jesus? That he rejected self-interest. I like to describe this as the real battlefield, the real spiritual battlefield, because some people like to put up this idea that there's this, still, that there's this devil image that is always at war with you. So the spiritual battle is some sort of battle between God's spirit and that spirit or between me and that spirit or whatever. The real battlefield happens in here. In the choices that I make, in the decisions I make to do the will of God or to follow self-interest. Simple as that. And it's it's a hard battle because the choices are full of dilemmas. All of those things that Jesus was tempted with are not evil in themselves. Some of them are quite good and maybe the way that a life needs to travel as God calls them to travel. But we have to make that assessment and I can't make it for you and you can't make it for me. It's our journey in the wilderness and we have to follow whatever it means. It's the battle between God's will, self-interest and God's will, which is also about valuing love. God's will is always to do with valuing love. Jesus only gave us one commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and your neighbour as yourself. That's it, one commandment. Don't create any others, that's it. That's the basis of what he calls the kingdom of God. It's that world in which Jesus wants to establish where all people love one another, just like that. Where valuing love rules. So Jesus comes to bring the message of the kingdom of God to earth. Jesus was faithful to his mission. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. Now that that little quote at the end, later in chapter 4, comes after Jesus has healed a whole group of people in Capernaum. And after that, I think he's tempted to stay there. Well, at least the people say, we want you to stay and be our healer, our, our, our friend, our preacher, our teacher for all time. But his mission was to travel around and share the good news of the kingdom of God with all sorts of people and he illustrated that kingdom of God by healing people. He brought them health and wholeness because that's what the kingdom of God's about. It's an illustration of important work within the kingdom. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God in other cities also. So Jesus is be fulfilling the mission which God gave to him in teaching and preaching and fulfilling all of that. So rather than the result of temptation being negative, as we tend to think it is guilt, guilt, punishment, you know, 
all those negative things. Uh, just being tempted sometimes brings that to people's mind. According to Hebrews, what follows temptation is grace. Acceptance. Why? Because Jesus has been there already and Jesus understands. Jesus is interceding for us who struggle in life. He accepts us just the way we are. We are the children of God struggling to understand what it means to be the children of God. So, let us, as the second half of that Hebrews reading, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The result of our struggle in all kinds of areas of life is that God loves us. God encourages us. God values us. God teaches us, directs us, and shows us his absolute love and grace. That's my introduction to Jesus. That's what Jesus is on about. We struggle in life. He's been there with us, before us. He shows us the way and loves us anyway. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the grace that you offer to us. We pray that as we struggle within the definition of what it means to be a Christian person, to be a child of God, as we struggle to do your will, to love one another as you would love us, we pray that you will strengthen us and help us to make right choices so that we do not sin. But when we do, we will be gracious enough to accept your forgiveness and understanding. We pray that you will bless us, encourage us and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen.